Good morning, everybody. We're the Julian family. I'm Wade. I'm Pearson. I'm Riley. I'm Brittany. We want to thank y'all for joining us this morning for our online services at Northside Baptist Church. Let us start out with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we pray for our pastor as he presents the word of God to us. And Lord, while this coronavirus is separating us from our church families, I pray that we will listen and understand his word. Amen. Hey, welcome to Northside Baptist Church Online Worship. I'm Keith Warren, Executive Pastor, and this is Van Hauser, our Senior Pastor. We're excited that you've joined us this morning. Well, we're learning, Keith, that the yep. church is not a building. That's right. Man, our fellowship has come together in so many ways. Yep. We've used a lot of platforms. Our groups are meeting. We're seeing people that are meeting each other's needs. Yep. It's an exciting thing to be a part of the, the church at this place right now. It really is. And remember, our staff is available to serve you. You can find us on our social media accounts or websites. You can email us. You can call the office. We're here to meet your needs if you have those. Let us know. You know, our people have been so faithful over the years to take care of our needs. Yeah. Uh, how's the budget going right now? Yeah, it's a little it's a little stressed right now. <laughs> yeah, a little be. bit stressed. Yeah. It could be. And I know that eventually we're going to see all of this flow in to meet the needs of our church in missions. We've got a lot of people we're helping right now, right. Uh, a lot of stuff going on. I want to encourage you to look for that uh, online giving and, and give there. Bring a check by, mail a check. But we appreciate you for being so faithful. Hey, you know, uh, before we get to Sam's message, I want to read a passage of scripture because yeah. this really speaks of the way that God takes care of us. Yeah. In Isaiah 40, it says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth. He never becomes faint or weary. There is no limit to his understanding. He gives strength to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Youth may become faint and weary. Young men may stumble and fall. But those who who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not faint. Amen. You Amen. know, Sam did a great job last week. Yeah. And uh, this week, he's going to be talking about the miracle of Christ over nature. But it's a fishing story. All right. Yeah, it's going to be pretty interesting. Yeah. Let's listen to some great music. Welcome to Worship Northside. This is the day the Lord has made and he has called us to lift up the powerful name of Jesus. Gather your friends and your family and let's sing to the Lord today. Here we go.
desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living
grandparents, family, friends. This will be a great time to gather your loved ones back, you know, around you and just encourage them today that there's hope found in the name of Jesus. There's hope found in a relationship with Jesus. And in a lot of uncertain times, I think it's so good that we are reminded goodness of God. And God is so good. Just turn to your family or friends right now and just let them know that God is good in the midst of all that we're going through. And let these words wash over you today as we worship.
Folks, it's time now for us to come together in prayer. I don't know that I can possibly get across to you the seriousness of this moment. I'm going to ask you if you're kind of active in the room right now, or if the children are in different places, would you kind of gather them up? Maybe let those children come closer to the screen or gather together as a family. You may want to join hands as we have this prayer time because this is an important time in our country, in our church, in our community, and in the lives of so many people. The power of prayer is amazing. It's the one authority we have on earth over all that's going on. I'm gonna ask you as we gather together to do what we do every Sunday, and that is open our hands and open our hearts. In the quietness of this moment, I would ask you to silently pray Silently pray for our nation. Silently pray for your family. Holy God and creator of this entire universe, I thank you for the privilege to come before you in this hour of need. God, we have learned through history and we have learned through our own lives that sometimes it's desperateness that drives us to you. There is no one who loves us more. There is no one who understands the need we are in. There is no one whose tears fall any more than yours do over what's happening around our globe. For those families around the world that have lost loved ones, for those workers in the medical units and on the front lines, for those that are trying to make policy and for those that are trying to guide us through that, I pray that you would bless them with wisdom. God, I pray for an answer. I pray that you might pour out into the mind of someone that which would relieve us of this burden on our nation. God, there are some today that are really dealing with some deep emotions, the tenseness of a home, the, the things that are going on, sometimes even anger, frustration, grief. God, I pray for all those things that each family and each individual might understand it's their responsibility whether a child or a youth or an adult, to be able to let go of their emotions in a quiet way, to carry them to you, that there might be peace in the home, that there might be peace in the community and peace in the world. So Father, I pray today that you would heal our land. Thank you for this time together and this time with you in Jesus' name, amen. So glad that you've joined us again online for our worship service experience. I hope you've really enjoyed the, the worship time with Brad and the praise team. They do such an awesome job. We're going to continue on uh, in our miracle series. And uh, it's been said that a miracle is God's hand in the glove of human events. And if that is the case, I think it's a fair question to ask is why were there so many miracles in the Bible and so few miracles today? Well, the truth is, if you take a look at it, you'll, you'll see there's probably fewer miracles in the Bible than you think, and probably more miracles happening today than you know of. And there's a good biblical reason why there would be a higher concentration at certain points in history. So let's just take this one at a time. Look at miracles in the Old Testament. The saints of the Old Testament, when they talked about miracles, David would say in Psalm 77 that they were wonders of old. Most believers in the Old Testament would have had the same question that we do today. Where are all the miracles that happened like they did with Moses and Elijah? They would ask those kind of questions. And it's simply a mistake to think that miracle, miracles occurred as a daily occurrence in the life of the Old Testament saints. Miracles would cluster around 
points of time, like when God would deliver his people with Moses in the Exodus, or when Elijah was forming, uh, being the head of the prophets, and, and that you would see miracles cluster around that point in time. Uh, but for the Old Testament, Old Testament saints, they were truly, uh, most of the time, they were living by faith in the promises of God based on wonders of old, and they were having faith in what God had done that he would continue them in the future. What about miracles in the New Testament? When it comes to the New Testament, the miracles were pointing to a day in the future when Jesus would rule and reign on this earth. They were sneak previews of coming attractions. Jesus would explain that his miracles pointed to his divinity. And throughout the New Testament, it is obvious that, the, uh, that Jesus did some incredible miracles, and so did the apostles. However, you need to know that even though the apostles worked in the miraculous, they got sick, they were thrown into prison, and they eventually died. So it would be a huge stretch to think that Christians in the first century were performing miracles on a daily basis. It, it just wasn't the case. They did not do it the way that Jesus did when he was on earth. So let me give you three observations concerning miracles. My first observation is that we should not think of the Bible, New Testament, Old Testament, as times in which the saints of God consistently did miracles. That would be a distortion of the biblical record. Uh, they were few and far between in the Old Testament. They were uniquely concentrated in the time of Christ. Uh, and the apostles moved in the miraculous probably more than most people, but it was for a validation of the person and authority of Jesus. The second observation I would make is there's probably more miracles happening today than you're aware of. If we could take the authentic record of missionaries and churches and believers around this world, how they have seen sickness healed, how they've seen uh, devils cast out, how they've seen the miraculous happen through what we would call coincidence maybe, we would think that we're living in a world of miracles because we are. So there's probably less miracles in the Bible than you'd think and probably more miracles going on than you know. A third observation I would make is that the kingdom of God has not fully come yet. It is not fully arrived. The heart of Christianity is that Jesus is the Son of God come into the world at a point in history to reveal what God is like and to accomplish the mission that made salvation possible for me and you. So miracles cluster around that appearance in history in the life of Jesus and the apostles to vindicate uh, his claim and their writings. So Christianity is basically a life lived, looking back with confidence on the work of Christ and sustained presently by moving forward towards this consummation of this coming kingdom. So it's being willing to suffer, to love, and call people to faith here and now. And here's the thing. When we call people to repent, we're not asking them to believe on Jesus because of a miracle they saw yesterday. When we are calling on people to accept the free gift of salvation that Jesus offers, we're doing so on the basis of the glory of Jesus Christ revealed in his death on the cross and his resurrection. This is what I want you to see. This is very important. Even if miracles were happening every day, the foundation of faith would still be on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, not on a miracle, so to speak. So the miracles of Jesus can be put into three categories. There's miracles over healing, uh, or miracles of healing, miracles over nature, and miracles of casting out demons. But the greatest miracle of Jesus would be that he rose from the dead. And from last week, and we're going to go all the way through Easter, we're going to look at the different categories of these miracles. And today, we're going to look at the miracles that Jesus performed over nature. So miracles over nature... Uh, it's just the miracle that Jesus would perform over natural things, whether it's uh, with people, water, animals, you know, trees, natural things. And in most of these miracles over nature, there was this human ability to participate. And there was also a command for the people involved to use the means they had to partner with Jesus in this. He allowed this to happen. But don't think that people were doing the miraculous thing. The miraculous always belongs to God. For instance, he told Simon Peter, 
throw your nets over the side of the boat for a great catch of fish. Simon's job, throw the net over. That's the natural part. The supernatural part was that Jesus would make sure they were filled with fish. When Jesus fed the multitudes, the disciples' job was to organize the people, distribute the food. The supernatural part, the miraculous part, belonged to God, Jesus, and he is the one that uh, multiplied the fish and the loaves. So the process that leads to the supernatural is always found in the natural. If a miracle is to occur in your life, it will not be because you have done anything except that which was natural to you. God is the one who performs the supernatural part of anything that we call miraculous. So these miracles over nature, they point to Jesus as God incarnate because the only person the elements of nature would be subject to and obedient to is the person who created them. And that's what we see in Jesus. So let's take a look at uh, Matthew chapter 17. And we're going to see uh, a miracle over nature. One of my favorite stories in the Bible, especially in the Gospels. Matthew chapter 17, and we'll start with verse 24. When they came to Capernaum, those who collected the temple tax approached Peter and said, Does your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he said. Now, if Jesus ever had a base of operation, Capernaum was it. Uh, it was the place where he spent a lot of time, and it just happened to be the Roman tax center for the uh, province of Galilee. So Jesus spent a lot of time there, and talk of tax was a big deal. But what we have in this verse is one of two very important questions that we're going to see in this passage. See, the tax being dealt with here is not a Roman tax, but a very Jewish tax, the temple tax. All adult Jewish males showed their solidarity to the Holy Land, and they showed their pride as a Jewish male in paying this tax that was set up back in the days of Moses in the Exodus. So this first question that we get, does your teacher pay the temple tax? It is a question about the tax law. In New Testament times, this was known as the two drachma, or the two days wages tax. The money went towards the maintenance and the upkeep of the temple. And the Romans, because they were in charge, they would often confiscate this offering or this tax, and they would put it towards their pagan temples, which made a lot of Jewish males not want to pay this tax because it was going towards idolatrous things. But the local IRS agents of the day there in Capernaum, they stopped by, and, and maybe they had been waiting for Jesus. Maybe they were trying to trap him with this. Maybe they were just curious about his position on this matter. But Peter's response to these guys was really quick. They said, does your master pay the temple, temple tax? Yes, right away, without thinking. It almost makes you wonder if he knew whether or not Jesus had paid this tax. And as we're going to see, he had not paid this tax. But when they leave, Peter slips into the house, and he's probably thinking, I hope he does pay the tax, or I, I, I hope he's willing to, or he has. I wonder if I should even say anything to him. Well, Peter didn't have to say anything because Jesus brought it up. Look at 25, verse 25. When he went into the house, Jesus spoke to him first. Here's the second big question, second important question. What do you think, Simon? Simon? From whom do the earthly kings collect tariffs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? From strangers, he said. Then the sons are free, Jesus told him. <laughs> Before Peter had a chance to say anything, Jesus asked the question. And we encounter one of uh, his cryptic teaching methods where he seemingly asks these off-the-wall questions to bring home these beautiful principles and spiritual lessons uh, for his disciples and for us. So the second big question, the second important question was a question about the lawmaker. The first important question was about the, the tax law. The second important question is about the lawmaker. Jesus uh, asked Peter if government officials collect taxes from their own children or from their subjects, the strangers? Well, Peter gives the obvious answer. He says, it's from strangers. That's who they collect taxes from. Then the sons are free, Jesus would say. And this question serves to raise the issue of the identity of Jesus. His reasoning is clear. 
What Jesus is saying is if the sons are exempt and he is the begotten son of the same God who ratified this tax law that's now being enacted 15 centuries at least later in his life, is he obliged to pay it? This is the question that's been raised. Should the son of God pay the earthly temple tax? Now, behind all the gold crowns, political parades, pompous pretense, kings are mere men. But God is God. So we're not just talking about whether a son of a king gets preferential treatment. What we're saying is the discussion is about the son and the one who is the king, the king of all kings. The God who relinquished the rights of heaven and uh, voluntarily saddled himself with humanity. He forgave harlots. He hugged children. Uh, He came not to be served but to serve. This one, Jesus, would die for those who would kill him, but he would also be the one who would pay their tax. The one for whom the temple was built would pay the taxes for its maintenance and upkeep. So if Jesus came not to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many, paying a temple tax is a piece of cake. So in order to emphasize his identity as the son of God with authority over all things in his kingdom and to emphasize the humor of God being asked to pay taxes, Jesus works an interesting miracle. And what this is, is this one important command. There were two important questions, but one important command. Take a look at verse 27. Jesus tells Peter, But so we won't offend them. Go to the sea, cast in a fish hook, and take the first fish that you catch. When you open its mouth, you'll find a coin. Take it and give it to them for me and you. One important command. Jesus sent Peter to the Sea of Galilee and told him to bring up the first fish that he caught. That fish would have enough money in its mouth to pay the two days wage tax, the two drachma tax, the temple tax for Peter and for Jesus. This astounding miracle clearly demonstrates Christ's complete control over the natural elements. He knew which one of all the fish in the Sea of Galilee had a coin in its mouth. He knew the location of that one fish, and he knew that it would be the first fish that Peter would catch. So what I want you to see in this one command is we have a unique miracle. It is a unique miracle. Why is it unique? Because this is the only miracle Jesus ever performed that dealt with money. And notice, he didn't bring money out of thin air. He didn't create money. He didn't do that. But this is the only miracle that Jesus did that dealt with money. He spoke of money quite a bit, but never did a miracle performing with money. Secondly, this is the only miracle Jesus ever did uh, something for himself. The Son of God, who is capable of doing anything and everything, never did anything for himself except in this one miracle. He never catered to his own needs. Even when he was asked to turn stones to bread for his hunger, he didn't do that. The third thing about this miracle that makes it unique is that it deals with a single fish. Most other miracles that dealt with fish in the ministry of Jesus was multitudes of fish. This is one. So not only is this a unique miracle, it teaches us a unique and exceptional principle. A unique miracle that teaches us an exceptional principle. In a few days from this point, Jesus is going to charge into the temple for which he pays his tax. He's going to turn over the tables of the money changers. And these guys are going to be highly offended at Jesus. So Jesus is not concerned so much in the offense that people take to him I think there was something in this situation uh, with these temple tax collectors. I think that what Jesus is doing not to offend them is because Peter had already told them, yes, my master paid the temple tax. And because Peter had already given his word that Jesus did pay it, I don't think he wanted to cause an offense by giving the appearance that Peter had lied to him. 
However, by collecting the, t- the tax payment through miraculous means, Jesus is letting Peter know that it's not a tax that he's obliged to pay, or obligated to pay, should I say. If it were, there would have been enough money in the mouth of that fish to cover all the disciples. Jesus was teaching this principle, and, and you need to get this. It's called kingdom expediency. It's a high kingdom value to never unnecessarily offend. Jesus does not have to pay this tax, but he does so so that others won't stumble. Here's the key to understanding the value of Christian expediency, kingdom expediency. If we insist that we are free, preserving our Christian freedoms at all costs, we destroy the integrity of the Christian mission, bringing offense to people we're called to serve in the name of Christ. We're wiping out any opportunity that we may have to win those people to the faith. Don't unnecessarily offend. It's kingdom expediency. The third thing I want you to see in this miracle is that there is a practical partnership. Now, many of the things that God brings to pass on earth happens through the works of man. Many things that God does on this earth comes through and he uses people to make it happen. God chooses to primarily work and move through the natural actions of human vessels on this earth. And this is how it happens. As man does his natural part, God does the supernatural, especially in how things all work together. So Peter is not going to have money to pay this tax unless he puts a hook in the water. It was up to Peter to do his natural part to go fishing. And God's supernatural part was to make a fish with a coin in his mouth bite the hook. The process that leads to the supernatural is always found in your natural actions. Now, I brought this up earlier. Jesus could have brought a coin out of thin air. He he could have produced it. I mean, he, he had the capability of doing that. He could have had any other animal. He could have had a dog or a cat or a tiger or a lion or a bear, oh my, bring the coin to Peter to pay the tax. But what did Jesus choose to do? He chose fishing for a fisherman. The natural always precedes the supernatural. Peter was to do what he has always known how to do, what he was trained to do, what he was. He was a fisherman. So Jesus said, do your natural work of fishing and watch how I bring supernatural effects from it. When you're praying and seeking God to perform a miracle in your life, understand this, the supernatural will be found in what you naturally do. There's no special incantation you have to say. Uh, There's nothing you have to do particularly besides trust God and do what you naturally do. He will take care of the supernatural part. He proved it in the life of Peter, and he'll do it in your life as well. See, none of these events, the, the fact that someone lost four days' worth of wages into the Sea of Galilee, that's not supernatural in and of itself. The fact that a fish would swallow this coin not supernatural in and of itself. The fact that Peter would catch this fish is not supernatural in and of itself. But what makes it miraculous is that they all converge and merge together in this one instance when Jesus said it would, and that makes it a miracle over nature where the purpose and authority of the Son of God is revealed and displayed for all to see. Listen, if the Lord could discern the money that would be found in the mouth of a fish, don't you think that he could discern your needs as well? Don't you think that there's things in play that you can't see going on behind the scenes because it's all going to merge and converge at a point in your life when you're praying, asking God to do a miracle in your life, to perform something, to provide something for you? Also, if the Lord could provide this need, would he not know what your need is and know how to provide it as well? You see, it's easy for us to get fixated on our temple tax, so to speak, and forget that the one who inspired it to be paid not only abides with us, he abides in us. 
also, uh, our Savior is at no loss to provide for his people, whether it's temporal or eternal. God wants to provide for you. That's one of the names that he give, uh, that it was said by Abraham that became a title for God, Jehovah Jireh, he's the God who provides. And nothing is too difficult for him. Who knows in your natural everyday life, as you're going about doing what you do, God could be working out something supernatural for you to provide a need that you would have or maybe a need that you didn't even know you were going to have. Our God is good, and he's looking out for you. I'm going to close this with a word of prayer. I'm going to ask that maybe you just gather around with your family right now, put your arms around them, and let's just pray to this God who provides, this miracle-working God that we serve. And let's ask him uh, and ask him to provide for our needs, and let's thank him for what he's doing right now behind the scenes. Let's pray. Father God, I am so thankful that you provide our needs. I'm so thankful that you are arranging and orchestrating heaven and earth to meet together at a specific time so that there could be provision for your children. God, we are so thankful that you do what you do in the way that you do it, how you use our natural actions to allow us to have a practical partnership and something that you do supernatural. It's just amazing to me, and it blows my mind. God, we, just, we give our love and our thanks, and our, all glory belongs to you because of how you meet those needs in our life, whatever they may be. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, thank you for joining us for this online worship experience, and I hope that you'll be back next week. Thank you, Sam, for a great message, and we thank you for joining us online today. Pastor, it's been a great morning. Oh, I'll tell you, what a beautiful day this is in worship together, and I appreciate everyone who's given us that time and attention. Absolutely. A special word of thanks to all of our tech team Amen. and all of those musicians and the work they put in this week so that we've had a great hour of worship. Have a blessed week. Amen.